So before you get started drawing, it can be useful to have your tools set up in advance so you've got several different tools to work with. I've got more than you would usually need here, but I've got a selection for you to consider. Um, one is having mechanical pencils of multiple sizes. I've got a 0.3 and a 0.5 and a 0.7 here to allow me to be more precise when I'm adding detail in. Um, a finer tipped pencil, like a 0.3, is going to allow you to have a more fine careful line, but does tend to break easier or more easily unless you have the harder leads that are sold precisely for that reason. Um, you can actually do most of your drawing with the number two um, and then add in some darker values. Now other options are getting some drawing pencils. This is a 3H. Anything with an H is going to be a little bit lighter and harder. The H stands for hard. Anything with a B is going to be darker and softer. Other options in addition to having the drawing pencils for the darker values are having an ebony um, or this is a Creative Color Monolith which is a graphite stick in pencil form which allows you to apply graphite directly. Other graphite sticks come like this um, and they are often also coated by darkness and softness so a B will be softer, anything in the A range will be harder and lighter. Now, it can also be very useful to have a sharpener on hand, as well as several options for adding highlights at the end. Here I've got a charcoal pencil in the white, which will allow me to work on top, but many classrooms will also have a white colored pencil available. Now, the white colored pencils are very different in quality depending on the brand. Um, the Blix are okay. Crayola tends to be a little bit less opaque. The more opaque, the more useful here and the charcoal tends to be a little bit more blendable. In addition here, I've got a white Conte that you might want to consider investing in for pulling out highlights. <laughs> Many of the lighter tones are especially useful if you're working on a middle toned paper. All right, so today we are going to work on drawing, and in particular, we are looking at how to draw anything you want but when scientists are drawing animals and plants, they have to observe very closely in order to get all the details to make it very clear which species they are drawing. So what I am going to do is walk you through all the steps that you need to draw from observation. Ideally, if you were a scientist in the field, you would be looking at animals as they move around. But it also helps us to look at photographs of animals, and if we were... A naturalist like James Audubon, we might even be looking at dead animals or stuffed versions of animals that are taxidermied, so that it's easier to get all of the details that are very hard to capture when the animal is moving, in flight, swimming, etc. So one of the things that I've done before I am beginning to draw is to use some internet-based research to look up what the animal looks like in the wild. Now I have looked at multiple images and what I've done is selected an image that is in good focus, has good lighting, and also shows the animal's whole body. I don't want an image that has the feet cut off or the wings blurry because of flight, etc. And we are looking in particular at a snow goose today because we're studying polar ecosystems. So snow geese are related to many other geese and ducks and other water birds, but they all have particular features which we want to capture in our drawing. Now, all of these drawings are going to begin with very basic shapes, which anyone can do. So here's my field of drawing, and I'm going to begin with the biggest shape that I see, which is the body of the goose. And I'm noticing an oval, which is more narrow towards the tail, and broader towards the breast. So that's one of the biggest shapes that I see to begin with. Now, one of the things I want to do is look at the proportions or the relative measurements between the shapes and the different parts of the body. So the next most obvious shape is the head and the neck of the goose. But what I want to do is use my hands or a tool like a pencil, try to measure how long is the body on my paper because I'm not always drawing to realistic scale but perhaps the scaled down version. Now, relative to the body, the neck in my image is almost the same length, maybe 80% of the length of the bird. So what I want to do is measure and make sure I have the same space. And I'm going to mark that off here with a small measuring line. 
many of these initial marks that I'm making in the beginning of my drawing will be erased or marked over as I develop it. Now the shape of the head of the goose is mostly a circle. So I can see the circular shape here. But I also want to notice that once I build that shape, I will be revising it in order to make it more realistic. There's a curve in the neck. So when I'm looking at this portion of the goose's spine, I want to try to capture what I see in the image. Now, this is variable depending on what the goose is doing. The measurement might be different, the angle might be different, but the general width won't change too much. Here, I feel like I maybe made the neck a little bit too narrow to begin with, so I'm going to keep working with that line. <laughs> Mechanical problems with lead pencils may happen. And I'm going to keep revising the shapes that I'm creating. Now on top of that basic oval for the head, I'm seeing in my source image the beak is roughly triangular but round at the tip. And I also see that perhaps I can add a little bit of length to the body as I start to add the tail. Now, the tail is made of multiple pieces. There's a bone in there, but there are also a lot of feathers that are showing up. So I'm going to use rough triangles to capture the shape, and I'm going to change those triangles over time as I get more accustomed to the shape of the bird itself. It's very important to use observation here and not rely on what I think about the animal. So I'm building up the basic shapes and as I work here, I am also working on revising and changing my measurements using my eye and my mathematical knowledge. So I'm changing the proportions as I work and I'm starting to use a looser style of drawing over time, which is called sketching. So in this style of drawing, I don't need to erase a lot. I'm actually starting with the shapes that I created, and then I'm going to darken up the lines once I become certain of where the shapes are. This is great because it allows me to observe and change and change with my information that I'm gathering from my eyes. Now, what is particularly interesting about this, if we were doing field sketches, is that animals don't stay still. They are not plants, right? So. Even plants move, but much more slowly than we can see. And in the field, animals don't stay in one position unless they're asleep. And this is part of why it's very useful for scientists to have some knowledge about drawing. Because if I'm collecting ornithological information, it's interesting for me to know what the birds are doing and to try to capture that when I may not always have a camera at the ready I may not always have it at the quick speed that I would prefer. So I'm going to go over my lines. I'm going to correct my initial information and make it more precise as I go along. I'm looking for the shape of the eye socket. I'm checking the angle of the beak. And as I develop the image, I am working on more and more precise information. Now, I have intentionally selected a position where the bird is a little bit more still. I'm checking the proportions of the neck and I'm thinking that maybe I need to make the neck a little bit longer, which means that I'm going to revise and change what I started with. And here's where I may use an eraser to start to develop it and change the proportions a little bit. Again, in real life, I'm working from an animal that is living and in the environment, I may need to continually change and revise in order to capture the movement that I'm looking for. So from these very basic shapes, I'm starting to break it down into more specific shapes and to gather more information. What is very interesting about this as I work is that I'm actually learning about the animal as I go. So for example, here we have the basic shape of the animal. I'm starting to feel more confident about that. So once I have that basic shape, I'm starting to add what we call shading or value. As I'm adding that shading and value, I'm starting to turn my flat shapes into form. And as I'm developing that, I may find that I refine or change what I had to begin with. For example, here I see that in my source image, there's a wing that's behind the bird. And I also see that he has a shoulder joint, he or she has a shoulder joint that is showing.
So this hump here is where the shoulder blade of the bird exists and is helping it to articulate its wings when it flies. That sort of information, anatomically, is very useful for scientists that are trying to understand different organisms. Perhaps not as obvious with something like a goose. But if we were comparing a goose to a duck in their flight range, knowledge about the size of their wings, for example, and the articulation is very, very useful. All right, I'm adjusting the eye up as I adjusted the head. And I am building some detail as I shade the bird. One of the things that I'm doing as I'm developing from a shape drawing into a more detailed rendering is checking the outside lines. Now, I can develop this through line, but I can also push it a little bit later by changing the shape of the background. So I can shade the background, shifting the value in order to determine exactly where the edge of the animal lies and the beginning of the world around it begins. In addition to the shoulder blade hump here that I see, I also see a very discernible hump where the hip is beginning. It's probably the pelvis of the bird, and we have to think about birds, right? So birds have to lay eggs to contain their young and reproduce, and so their pelvis is a little bit wider than some of the mammals and other animals in terms of their general anatomy, which allows them to lay a hard, firm, shelled egg and reproduce in that way while gestating outside of the body. Here, I'm starting to notice some shapes of the pin feathers in the wings. Now these are folded back, but they're still very relevant to the general anatomy of the bird. As I build the value, I am also paying very close attention to the shapes that I'm observing. And this close attention, this close observation, is very useful for scientists. It's not just artists making a beautiful image, but also scientists working to collect information about diverse species that want to observe what the animals really look like. What are the differences between a snow goose and a Canada goose? They have clear differences, not just in coloration, but also in the shapes of different parts of their bodies, the proportions that they offer, etc. So as I'm observing closely, I may want to keep a notebook with some notes about what I notice about this bird in relation to other birds that I may be more familiar with. And that cross comparison can build my knowledge base. So I'm working continuously, looking closely, and it might take more than one session. There is a moment in an artist's life, particularly an artist that is paying attention to science, where it may be useful to take a break and compare what you're drawing to other images, or perhaps a live bird that you're observing in the field or elsewhere. In real life, scientists would make multiple images of the species that they're studying in order to gain the most knowledge possible, and they would share that with other scientists by publishing and sharing. Now, in your environment, you might be able to pay attention to certain animals that you see often, perhaps capture a photograph, Perhaps just pay very close attention and make some loose field sketches or some tighter sketches like this that are more observational and contain a little bit more information. Now, as I'm drawing, I am not just capturing the general shape. You can see here that I'm layering multiple values on top of each other. Now, I want to always have some light values. Now, that includes white, but it may also include some light grays. And if I'm working with pencil, it's very useful to use my finger to smudge like this to develop a gray area. I can then erase out highlights that I need and correct. In addition to those light values, I also need medium values. This is a middle tone gray, and that middle tone gray is helpful to establish where the shadows are. So areas that are lighter tend to be reflecting light, not just if the animal's white like a snow goose, but no matter what the color of the creature is, or the form that we're looking at. And those white areas read to our mind as brighter and closer to us. Areas that are darker read as farther away, in shadow. So light always comes from a certain direction and the shadow will always go in the opposite direction. If you change the light, you will change the shadows, which is something that portrait photographers know. So I'm working in black and white. The snow goose has red legs. Now I can't draw red with my pencil, 
But what I can do is start to tone it down a little bit. And as I'm toning it down, I have an opportunity to correct the joints and actually even lengthen the legs here to make it look more like a snow goose and less like a duck. So I'm gonna correct my initial drawing and erase that entirely and I'll shade that into the background later in order to create a more correct proportion, make the animal look more realistic. Inside of its foot, I can use shading to show the anatomy. So there's a very clear distinction between the bones and the webbed areas of skin in between them. And I'm going to use the pencil to show that. And I can also take this opportunity to change the outline, correct it, and make everything more precise. Now I'm also noticing in my original observation, I did not include the shadow on the lower part of the bird. So I'm going to add that in. And I'm using a technique called cross hatching. So hatching are these short lines that I'm using to build up value or tone. Value is how light or dark the image is. And as I'm cross hatching, you can see that I'm turning my pencil and creating lines that go across each other in order to build up that tone. This is a little bit more effective than pressure in terms of building a more precise way to show ranges in value over a form. Ranges in value are important, not just because they can show color, that's part of it, but really much more important than color is they're showing where the form recedes or goes back in space versus where it's coming closer to you. This can help give a general sense of the volume of the, the figure that you're drawing. So with this bird, it can show how large it is or how rotund, but with another form, it will also show where it's rounding away from you and where Maybe highlights or raised areas. So I'm getting all this general form before I even think about the smaller feathers that are part of this bird's shape. Those smaller feathers are going to be what's called an overlay. They'll be here, but before I even get there, I want to make sure that I've been really precise about the overall form. It's really important to think about the general before the specific. And I'm still developing the outer edges. I'm considering this fleshy piece that connects to the more bony, scaly part of the leg. And I'm going to actually extend this bird's foot further down than I initially drew. I feel like I didn't make the legs long enough in my first measurement. Artists are constantly revising their work. They're always going back and changing it in order to make it more specific, more correct, and this is part of what artists do. And this is where artists overlap with scientists because scientists also don't always trust their first observation. Our first observation is always colored by our preconceived notions, what we think the animal might look like, what we think the environment like, look, might look like. And so it's important to spend time observing very closely and using drawing, photography, note-taking, writing, etc., to make those observations and ideas more correct, more precise, etc. So here I have a good amount of detail on the overall form. I still feel like I could lengthen the neck a bit. And this lead it's not always cooperating, but I know there's a white highlight on the top of the bird's head. So one of the things that I can do here is just extend this up, which will give me space for that highlight. Now I may need to move the beak to make it look more like an adult goose, and less like a gosling or a duck. And I'm simply going to erase here, and I will also consider later shifting that background. I'm going to go back and tighten up my lines once I revise the form. And this constant back and forth process is part of how artists work. Now here I have an overall image. Oh, pardon my shift, but I still want to actually develop a little more detail. So I'm going to look closely. Now, if you are using the internet for reference, it is very important that you consider the resolution of your image. So images come in different sizes. The resolution that is required for a screen is not as detailed as what would be required for other forms. For example, 
screen resolution is 72 dpi dots per inch pixels per inch is ppi now in terms of print quality it ranges between 300 dpi and 600 and you can see very easily from those numbers that the resolution is multifold increased so you're going to be extra sure that we are looking for high quality images or combining multiple sources together to get very accurate so what I am beginning to do is I am looking across those images and revising my image is to pull out more specific details. For example, I can see the feathers in the neck of the goose and I want to try to observe and make them the right size for the body of the bird. And I want to pay attention to how they overlap because if I represent this poorly, it may look like a different species. Scientists have to have accurate observations and work with those to make them as precise as possible to communicate with others. Remember, if you are experienced in the field, you may not always have a photograph of the animals that you want to share with people or the observations. So you may need to revise your study and make it more precise and specific for it to be accurate. Some scientific illustrators need to work from memory over time. So we're going back and forth between the image and the drawing. And as an objective observer, I'm trying as much as possible to be precise and correct. For example, I'm noticing that behind the temple of this bird, there is an indentation here behind the eye, and I'm trying to capture that. I'm going to use my hatching techniques and my cross-hatching. And I'm going to work on it and revise and change it. I may even lower down the hump of the back, reducing the overall size in order to try to get this more accurate. At this point in my drawing of the snow goose, I've got the basic outlines correct and I've got essential shadows in place. So what I want to do to make it more precise and more accurate is to push my values to have a range of values from light to dark and also to pull out more detail. To make that work more effectively, particularly on this more smooth paper that has less of a tooth, I'm going to work with some darker pencils, and possibly the graphite stick, not only to pull out dark values in the drawing itself, but also in the area around it, which will add to that layered value. So I'm still looking at my source image, I'm using the same image throughout, and I'm going to start building up my layers of graphite to deepen my dark values. One good place to start is the contour line. We've already sharpened that up quite a bit. So now I'm starting to use value in part in place of color. So on the beak, I've got an orange tone, but that tone compared to the tone of the skin, uh, the feathers I should say, is actually much darker in general because the orange against the white stands out. As I'm refining the value layers, I'm also going over my contour line and freshening it up. Now, depending on what the goose is contrasted against, I may also find that I need to pull out values in the background. Value in the background is going to be layered up in large swaths, so I'll find the graphite stick very useful for building that value up. So the graphite stick is especially useful because I can use the side of it to work a large area at once and start to lay down a gray tone. This is going to make the white of the goose stand out. You can see I'm using the side of the stick to shade in. And this is also very forgiving of any small errors I may have made in terms of my outline. I may have some pencil marks that stay on the paper. and I'm going to use this graphite to build it up. You can already see a little bit of pop here with my value range from middle value to a lighter value defining the shape of the animal. In the past, artists like Audubon were working not only on their own to create images in the field and from observation, but also working with master printmakers. The printmaker is a secondary artist not as often recognized on the lithographs themselves, but they were responsible for creating the prints and the plates that allow these images to be created in reproduction. So you can start to see here, I've got a range of tones from a middle value to a lighter value and an extraordinary light value here. The more I layer up, 
the darker the value will get. I'm going to start to build the whole background up. Now in my original image, I do have a fade in the background, but remember that my purpose here is to capture details in the figure. So the background is really secondary. It's just a way to make the image stand out. I'm going to correct the line of the head here. Keeping in mind, the more correct and accurate I can get, the more sure I can be that my image is representing a certain species of animal. Small details in the shape of the beak, the shape of the back, the shape of the wings can actually depict a slightly different species. So it's important for artists to be precise if they're going for scientific representation of their subject. It's important to connect to the interior shapes as well as the exterior. So in between the legs, I'm paying attention and shading in to create some contrast. And I can take some artistic license in terms of where I add the shadow in the backdrop, since the primary purpose of the backdrop is to make the figure stand out. I do, however, want some continuity. So I'm going to shade in most of the background around the animal, but with some attention to making certain areas, for example, this area against the breast, strategically darker to highlight the white of the feathers. Many beginning students are ready to stop and pause their first draft. So pushing revision and this concept of constantly reworking and getting more and more accurate is important to helping learners get a little bit more precise with representations of the animals that they're studying. This provides a built-in modification for those that need more advanced curriculum. If they already have some drawing skills, they may be able to add more subtle shading, for example, here I'm starting to add a little bit of texture to represent the layering of the feathers as I can see in my image. It's important to note here as well that depending on the source image, I may have different amounts of detail, so it's important to have source images that are accurate. If you're working on drawings in the field, then you may need to have multiple observations over time and also consult something like a field guide in order to make sure that you're representing accurately. Field sketches are valuable because they can represent movement and they can show some of the behaviors of the animal and they also spark us towards more detailed and specific observation as we are engaging in recording what we are observing. Now this line here is interesting because it actually represents the back wing of the snow goose and so I'm going to work to make sure I don't overlap it. In a moment, we're going to come into highlights. And so there, I'm going to pull in an eraser and also my white charcoal pencil in order to make those highlights more specific. Now, it is important to talk about paper. I'm working on a smooth printer paper here. That's what I had available. Um, if you're working on copy paper, you're going to have something similar where the paper has very little tooth. The tooth is the hand feel of the paper. You can actually feel the size of the paper fibers paper has a strong tooth, you'll feel it as you rub your hand over it. It'll make a slight gritty noise. The paper has almost no tooth. The surface will be very, very smooth, and you won't feel much resistance at all. For more detailed drawings, having a stronger tooth is more useful, as you can actually build up the graphite more efficiently, working with the grooves that are inherent in the tooth of the paper. Ebony pencils are fantastic for pulling out sharp lines. They are very, very dark and very smooth. So artists enjoy using them because it's easy to lay on very dark, very confident lines. I recommend using these towards the tail end of your discovery as this is where students can really start to pull out those details and make their contour, the outer edge of the line, extraordinarily precise. So those searching lines, those sketching lines we had in the beginning, some of which may have been accurate, can now be firmed up and adjusted as we get more precise. Notice that I haven't used an eraser yet. That's very intentional. We will pull one in as we get into highlights, but it's important to actually encourage students to work with revision of the original project. If we worked with erasers the whole time, we would have certain students who would shut down immediately and begin erasing, starting over, asking for new paper, etc. 
one of the principles here is that we're working with strategic revision, making our observation more and more precise as we go on. Original observations are not necessarily incorrect, they may just be imprecise, and that distinction helps us to build things up. Those sketch lines that appear in the beginning can be incorporated as value to render form as we go. Now again, I'm not working with absolute accuracy. I'm still searching and finding the angles, finding the lines as I go. And you can begin to see that even though I'm still working on the back of the goose, which is essentially a gray area, I am emphasizing and creating some areas that are essentially dark, very, very dark value, almost black, in order to create the distinction between the different layers of feathers, the different parts of the body. And this drawing quality is going to improve over time. You'd be amazed, even with younger students, they can get more and more precise as they observe. If you are teaching the science of the anatomy of the bird, you could start to point out the scientific names for the different parts of the anatomy of the bird, and perhaps the features and how they aid the bird in its everyday life. For example, the shape of the beak may be related to what the bird eats in its hunting conditions. The length of the wing feathers, the pin feathers in the wings, may be associated with how long it can glide and where it can fly, depending on the updrafts that are available in the region. We also have the feet, the webbed feet that we observe are important for aquatic birds as they allow them to paddle more efficiently. Even birds that spend most of their time gliding and diving usually have webbed feet if they're working and hunting in an aquatic area. As you can see, I started with a lighter gray and now with my ebony pencil, or I could use also a 4B or a 6B even, I can pull out these sharp, dark outlines and start to sharpen up my image. Again, I don't need to use an eraser yet. I can use this darker pencil to pull out my form first. You'll find that with younger students, there's less of a tendency to erase, but as students approach fourth grade, fifth grade, and get older, they want to erase the work they've done so far because they're not recognizing how even small mistakes in art can build up to a masterpiece. So keep those mistakes. Let them become part of your background, part of your form, and inform what you are creating. It's also important, I always point out to my students that the work that I'm creating is going to be at a faster speed, and they are not expected to work quite as quickly in their own designs. It's simply a demo to help them get more precise. Now, I can see a lot more anatomical detail in the feathers of the wings now, though they're not 100% precise. I may find that I want to refine and add more detail as I go, and I can switch tools. So I was working with the ebony, but in order to get that precision in the shading of the wings, I may want to go back in with the graphite stick. Again, I've got a few options with the graphite stick. I've got this broader stick. I've got the more detailed pencil. The ebony is going to be darker, and if I wanted to get super, super dark, I could go with a Conte or with a charcoal. So for now, what I want to do is build up the layers of shadow here on the breast of the bird to build a sense of depth or form. I can add some additional information about where the chest recedes and wraps around the bird. Of course, this is all dependent on lighting, so it's a little bit more helpful if the image is well lit. This is going to obscure my original hatch marks a bit, but I'm not erasing them. Again, I'm using that information that I captured to help me layer up the actual material on the form of the bird. For example, this was a sort of shorthand that I had here around the leg. I'm going to extend it a bit, I'm going to build on top, and if I look carefully, if I've got a good quality image, I may be able to be, I may be able to see features like the feathers. And I can imply that with a texture. So this repeated mark hopefully can be precise and specific and help me to give a sense of where the body recedes a bit, where the feathers lie on the form, and that earlier information is not incorrect, it's simply a place to work from. Again, this is a middle tone graphite stick. I'm guessing it's about an HB. It's not super dark, it might be a 1B. And so from there, I'm also going to fill in the shading on the leg. 
pull that out from the background. There is a strong shadow in my source image, which was intentionally selected, not only for being clear and sharp, but also being of decent resolution and having enough light to make it easy for me to see the forms. Now I have in the classroom worked with printouts. If you have technology or field guide, you can work from that as well. Many of the images and field guides are not necessarily super useful because they may not be high resolution. So if they're very small, they don't have a lot of detail, they're going to give your students less information to work from. You want to make sure you have enough information included in the image to revise it and make it precise. Again, key to scientific illustration is capturing the details as accurately as possible. I'm pulling out the outline of the foot. I'm observing closely to try to notice not only where the shadows are, but also the angles here. And I don't always have to create an edge by going interior. Here I'm going to shade away from the leg to keep the highlight that's there. And I'm going to use my finger or I can use a blending stump to blend it into the background using those hatch marks and my fingertip. Checking the outlines, checking the contour, sharpening those up. Again, not relying on outline alone, but also using light and shadow to create form. As the students are working, it's a good opportunity to talk to them, not only about the anatomical features, about the particular species that they're studying, but also to key them into qualities of good observers and the overlap between science and observation is also a good way to train them to collect scientific information. So if I make the background dark enough and pull out my lines, I can begin to imply that the bird is white, which you may not have picked up on earlier. So as I'm adding my dark layers, I'm not just adding them to the interior, but also to the exterior to create that contrast. The more you rework it, the more detail you'll get. But you will eventually hit a point where you really want to have a little bit of erasure in order to tidy things up, in order to pull out your highlights. So I'm adding a little bit of texture. I'm not getting super precise because I can't see this information. So this is an important point. Um, although we are working from a photograph, and my photograph is of decent resolution, I also am aware that there is information that I can't see. And if there is information that I can't see, it does not behoove me to represent it because that would be from imagination as opposed to observation. And I'm a scientist today in my observation of this snow goose, so I am trying to represent what I can see, not what I imagine about the bird, because if I'm only representing what I imagine, then I'm not going to be learning too much about the bird himself. I see a small shadow here, for example, between the leg joint and the body. This is caused by the shape of the musculature of the leg overlaid by the feathers on the body, which are a little bit more insulated, tapering off towards the feathers on the leg. If I compare this to other birds that frequent the same area, it might give me useful information about how much time it spends in the water versus how much time it spends roosting, for example. More information. Um, might be needed and if the students have questions I always point them out towards research if I don't know the answer oh it's a great question let's look it up let's find out now many classrooms will lean towards having students draw the same animal but I also want to encourage you to have students present some information if you teach these skills you can differentiate some students can draw the same animal in groups and others can work independently do independent research and present the information they've discovered about the species they have found as they share their drawings with the class. You know, in our art standards and Common Core, only some of the standards have to do with making art. Others have to do with connecting to other content area. We're clearly doing that here. And also responding to art and presenting.
As we are getting ready to add highlights, you've got several choices of eraser. Many schools have these available, these pink rubber erasers. They're okay, but they are sometimes limited in capacity in terms of picking up the graphite. A little bit superior are the white rubber erasers. They're a polymer that picks up the graphite more readily. Hopefully yours doesn't have paint on the end. This is a Stettler. Um, and then more advanced, we've got a kneaded rubber eraser, which can actually be kneaded and pressed to a certain shape and pull graphite to light in a certain specific area. So we're not going to use too much of the kneaded eraser today, in part because they've got limited utility on smoother surfaces. But we are going to start here. Now don't underestimate the value of the eraser that comes in the pencil. Many of these are small and narrow and very useful for going in. So I'm going to start here. I'm looking at my source image. And I'm noticing if there are any areas where I have shaded in, where I want to pull out a little bit. I don't have too many. And already I'm noticing some disconnect between my eraser and my paper. So this a white rubber eraser is not pulling the graphite up super efficiently. In these areas where it's a line, especially a line that was a measuring error here, I actually am having a fair amount of success, but in other regions, for example, I want to add a little highlight underneath the eye here. I'm getting more smudging than erasing. So if that's not working, I can pull in this smaller, finer eraser. Sometimes simply different compounds of rubber are more precise. But I also have the option of going in with my white charcoal pencil or my white Conte crayon. So with that pencil, I can then go in and be more precise about adding in the details of the highlights that I want to pull out. Now, a reminder, this is going to be very bright white against the paper, so it might be a striking contrast. So to get my snow goose looking really snowy, I'm observing my photograph, and I'm adding in some areas of white highlight. Pay attention to the marks that you're making, because here, these white marks made with the Conte or the charcoal are a little bit more difficult to pick up, which is a little bit surprising for those who have worked with black charcoal. Um, so the black charcoal is a bit more movable, but the white charcoal tends to lay down and not move around too much. I also want to take out a moment to point out the difference between a Conte and a charcoal. So the Conte is more waxy. It's got a wax base as a binder holding the pigment in place. Charcoal generally has a more dry binder and can be a little bit more appropriate for areas where you might want to blend. So I'm going to alternate back and forth. If I were doing them in an order, it would be preferable to do the charcoal first. If you tend to get any sort of detritus or a material accumulating on the charcoal itself, you can simply try to clean the tip by coloring on a scrap piece of paper to get the dirt off, or you can sharpen it again and bring it back in. Some of these age over time, so if you have an older pencil, check in, make sure it's still effective. Again, we're looking for overall value or tone. We're not looking for color in this variation of illustration. Now, if you wanted to add color in, you could layer watercolor on top of most of these materials with no problem. The only exception might be the Conte. Some of the Conte, due to the wax binder, may actually resist watercolor a bit. That's an easy way to color, which is not drawing based. I'm gonna keep going back and forth between erasing sharpen my lines, dropping in a little bit of a white highlight with a Conte, and perhaps even adding a little bit of dark shadow. Notice here the charcoal is working more as a blender than as a highlight. So if that's occurring, I can try an eraser to see if I can get a better, more desired effect. Many of the highlights are finishing touches. If you wanted to skip a step, I would probably choose that step to skip, um, other than the small erasures that may make it happen. 
one thing I'd really like you to consider as you're working with your students to refine these drawings is how you will display and present them. So it's important for a scientific illustration to have an audience. We want to share this information with somebody. Scientists would use publications, for example, Audubon, famously in the 19th century, was publishing his work and it was popularly accepted across the nation as an interesting piece of cocktail conversation and also a way to learn about nature in America. If you are working within your school, one thing you can think about is, is there a way to create a display that would not only showcase your student's talent, but also educate the school? So include information, include some details about the animals, perhaps include comparisons between different animals in order to educate. Um, students can be involved in adding labels and signage to help make this happen. In addition, you might also think about whether you want to publish outside of the school. For example, if students are working on different animals, they can easily assemble a local field guide that educates people about birds that frequent the area. One great resource for this is the Cornell Bird Lab. Um, Cornell Ornithology um, also has grants for binoculars, gardens, bird habitats, in order to help facilitate this work. So see if there are any partner organizations that you can work with in order to not only observe and draw, but publish your students' information. No age is too young to get their work out there, not only in a, wow, look at my beautiful art sense, but also in a, wow, we learned something that we can share with our community. So I hope that this lesson has been informative and that you feel inspired to practice your own observational drawings. Um, and as you're practicing, feel free to be a beginner with your students. Allow them to know that you're learning with them if you are new to the form. You'll be amazed at what students even at elementary age can produce as they're observing closely.